Okay, um, I think we can get started. Um, hey everyone, uh, welcome. Uh, we are going to be talking about OIDC and workload identity in Kubernetes. Uh, starting off with a brief intro, um, I'm Anish Ramshikar. I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. Um, I'm part of the Azure Container Upstream team working on security projects. I'm one of the maintainers of Secret Store CSI Driver. Uh, it's a Kubernetes CIGOD subproject. Um, and I'm from Seattle, Washington. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashutosh, and I work at Elastic. And I'm also a maintainer of Cluster API Provider Azure. So let's get started. Um, this is the agenda that we are going to talk about. So we are going to give an introduction around workload identity. So how many of you know about workload identity so far? Well, wow, that's great. Um, so when I was learning workload identity, uh, it, uh, I started to look into some basics. So we'll also do a refresher on authentication and authorization. It will not hurt us. And then Anis will help us understand workload identity in details. He'll go into how it works and explain in the context of Kubernetes. And we have a demo for that. And after that, we are going to talk about a couple of usages about workload identity in Kubernetes. So let us get started. Um, so workloads deployed on Kubernetes may require access to external resources on public cloud. Or maybe a workload in Kubernetes would like to talk to another workload in Kubernetes, and they need to identify each other. So workload identity is a way to authenticate workloads. Um, and you can see in this little diagram that I tried to make when I was trying to understand workload identity that let's say you have two pods, pod one and pod one. So you can consider these two as a workload and there is some identity associated with these two pods which will be used to authenticate. Um, let's, okay, so let's get into some basics of uh, you know, some jargons that you want to debunk here. Um, entity is something individual. It could be an individual or it could be a service, which, and identity is a set of attributes that can help you identify these entities. And authentication is a way of proving the identity to someone. And authorization helps you to tell that what are the set of actions that an entity can take. Um, so we had this, uh, you know, the traditional model of authentication. You have an app, you have server, and server has protected resources, and you could put your username and password to access the resources from the server, and it had a lot of drawbacks. You know, you couldn't do more fine-grained tuning to that, and if you wanted to revoke the access, it was terrible. Um, and also, providing your username and password could be risky, you know, if you want to provide that for a third-party app. And here comes OAuth 2.0. Um, so OAuth 2.0 is a standard. It's based on RFC 6749 that tries to standardize the way of, uh, you know, delegated authorization. And uh, if you see, there are four roles that I've written in the slides, like resource owner, resource server, client, and authorization server. Um, so resource owner is someone who owns the resources, the protected resources, and resource server is from the server from where you could access the, those resources. And client is someone whom you will, you as a resource owner will delegate authority to access the resources, and authorization server will help you to get access token to help you access the protected resources. Also, it is important to keep in mind that OAuth 2.0 does not define any standards around authentication. Um, so let's move to this little diagram that I've made here. So you can see uh, the client tries to do a re request via resource owner, and you, to, you, you can see in step two, I've written authentication, and OID, uh, OAuth 2.0 does not uh, define anything around authentication, so somehow let's say the resource owner authenticates to have a delegated authorization to the client, and now you see AS, that is authorization server, it passes an access token to the client app, and this client app can now exchange 
present this access token to use the protected resources. So this is a this is a client credentials flow in OAuth 2.0. There are other flows that are more relevant for web applications, but I just wanted to give an example on how this access token mechanics work. Um, so now let us talk about OIDC, which is one of the things that we'll talk when we talk about workload identity. Um, so Open ID Connect specifies a couple of standards to help do the authentication. And one of the things that we touch upon OIDC is mostly around ID tokens uh, that OIDC specifies it should be a JWT token. Um, and this JWT token will have uh, claims, for example, email, name, et cetera, to identify the entity. And yes, let's, let's see how OpenID Connect works. So you see this trigram. Again, you have an application and you have an authorization server. Uh, the client sends a request, and there is the request data that you can see. It says profile open ID. That is important when you are sending a request, mentioning that I need an OIDC thing. And you, the client gets the authorization code, and now the server sends this authorization code to the authorization server. And you see the difference here is that the authorization server is now sending two things, ID token and access token. So the server now can decide to uh, do something based on this ID token, and the server will know how to use that ID token because it, it will have a lot of details about the entity. And again, the same process. So how does our previous diagram look like if we put OIDC into perspective? Yeah, this is just for SO here. And now, Anis, help us understand workload identity. Okay, um, so we had a refresher on OIDC. Um, now, jumping into workload identity in Kubernetes, so first thing we start off is by defining what is a workload. Um, so in Kubernetes context, a workload is an application that's just running in a pod. A pod is a set of containers that contains the business logic, and each pod runs in a namespace, and it has a unique name, and then it also has a service account tied to it. Um, so when we look at workload identity in Kubernetes, um, some of the use cases that come up, uh, is the first one is the pod trying to authenticate with the Kubernetes API server. Uh, so applications running within the pods in the cluster often need to interact with the Kube API server. And for this purpose, what they do is they use the Kubernetes service account um, that's tied to the pod. And this is cru crucial for applications to perform actions like scaling pods, accessing Kubernetes secrets, getting data from config maps, or also inspecting the cluster state. Uh, the second most common scenario is authenticating communication from between the workloads, so workload to workload. Um, so for pod to pod communication in Kubernetes, it is essential for uh, ensuring that the security and the trustworthiness of interactions between the workloads uh, in the cluster. And then I think the third common use case that we see with workload identity is for pods that's running in the cluster, uh, they need to access an external protected resource. Uh, so this external protected resource could be a database, an API service, or any managed service that's running in a cloud provider um, uh, that requires authentication and authorization. Uh, the first two scenarios have been broadly covered in a couple of other talks, and then like that's something that's widely talked about. Uh, so for the purpose of this talk, what we want to do is focus mainly on the third one, which is trying to access external protected resources using workload identity. Um, so when we look at workload identity options, like some of it that comes to mind is what you see here on the list. Like this is in no way the entire list, uh, but just looking at it, the first one is Kubernetes Certificates API. Uh, so Kubernetes has had support for native certificate provision flows for a long time now. Uh, this can be done by just creating a certificate signing request. Um, and then a CSR is used to request that a certificate be signed by a denoted signer. And then it can be approved or denied by an approver before it's actually signed. Uh, the one caveat with this is uh, it requires uh, implementation of an approver, which means there is upfront work that needs to be done in order to consume this in a secure way. Uh, 
Um, and then the second one is service mesh. So if you're using a service mesh like Istio, Linkerd, or Envoy, uh, these tools often provide built-in features for secure authentication and authorization uh, between the services, uh, including MTLS and fine-grained access control. Uh, and then the third one, uh, Spiffe, is a standard, and then Spire is an implementation of Spiffe APIs that performs node and workload attestation uh, to securely issue SWIDs and two workloads, and then to verify the SWIDs that's presented by other workloads. Uh, so the thing with Spiffe is it does workload to workload authentication really well, but in addition to that, the jobs that are generated can also be used for workload identity to access external protected resources. So before I talk about the fourth one, Kubernetes service account, like one thing is out of the four, three options that we talked about, uh, service mesh and Spire are add-ons that need to be additionally installed in the cluster. Like it's not something that comes by default and the certificates API definitely needs some amount of groundwork to implement an approver. Uh, so this brings us to the last option that we have on the slide here, and that's the one that we're going to be discussing about in this talk, which is Kubernetes Service Account Tokens. Okay, so why Kubernetes Service Account Tokens? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is simplicity. So Kubernetes Service Account Tokens are built into the Kubernetes platform, uh, making them the simplest and the straightforward option for managing identity with Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you don't need to set up any external services or additional components to use them. Uh, and then the second one is native integration. It's tightly integrated, it's conformant, and it's tested. Um, and when we talk about Kubernetes service accounts, typically there, there are two of them. One is the default service account token, uh, which is existed in Kubernetes for a very long time now. Uh, some of the issues with that was one, it was automatically generated and stored in a Kubernetes secret for every workload that was created. Uh, that was until recently, and uh, there's a long cap that has been worked on to stop doing that and move uh, to a more secure projected service account. Uh, but in terms of other issues, like why we say it's not secure, is the jots are not audience bound, the JSON web token. Uh, so basically, any recipient of the service account JOT for, for the default service account can masquerade as a presenter to anyone else. Uh, and then the other issues where these JOTs were also not time-bound, so they wouldn't expire. The lifetime of it was basically tied to the Kubernetes service account existing in the cluster. And the scalability issue was every time a service account token was generated, a Kubernetes secret was created, and then that secret was mounted into the volume which means you have, if you had many pods consuming a service account, then you just had like a lot of secrets. Uh, so in comes projected service account token. So it's a bounded service account token that's time-based. Uh, these service account tokens are useful for workload to workload communication um, and can be used for accessing external resources. And they're also bounded service account. So basically the Kubernetes API server will enforce uh, the required attenuations. That is the time binding, the audience binding, and all of those. Okay, so this is how you, as a, like a pod, can request a projected service account token. So on the left side, what you have is a volume config. Uh, basically, the name there is the file name where the token will be uh, mounted inside the pod, and then the audience field is configurable, and it's also required, so you basically can say, like, I want a token for a particular audience, and the expiration seconds here denotes how long the issued token needs to be valid. Um, and then when we look on the right side, uh, this is what the new service account tokens look like. So the audience field there is what is configured in the volume config. Uh, and then the issuer claim, and then if you look at the expired and I issued that, like that should basically say one hour. Uh, but in addition to the standard claims that's available in the JOT, there's also Kubernetes-specific claims that are nested under Kubernetes.io that can uniquely identify a service account. So there's information about the pod for which this token was generated. And there's also information about the service account for which this pod was generated. And it's just not the name, but also the UID. So if the same service account is deleted and recreated, the token is no longer valid. Okay, 
Uh, so workload identity federation. Uh, so the, we talked about OIDC, we talked about workload identity, what a workload is, and service account tokens. So workload identity federation is what ties all of this together and enables you to basically access an external protected resource. So workload identity federation allows you to use the existing authentic authentication stack in cloud providers to authenticate and authorize workloads running in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, federation basically allows you to bridge the gap between the cluster's identity system and the cloud provider's identity, so enabling a seamless and secure interaction between them. Uh, it, uh, federation basically, the workload entity federation follows the OAuth 2.0 exchange protocol specification, so you provide a credential from your IDP to a secure security token service, so STS over here. Uh, which verifies the identity on the credential and then returns a federated token in exchange. And if you look at the flow diagram, basically we have a Kubernetes workload which is sending the projected service account token to an STS. The STS uses the OpenID Connect discovery protocol uh, to get the discovery document from the well-known OpenID configuration. And that discovery doc contains the JOCS URI, the JSON web key set, uh, which contains the public key of the service account signer. And using that, the STS can validate the authenticity of the token that it just got. And then there's also a trust relationship, uh, which basically says, if I have a token from a particular issuer and that matches the subject, then give me a token. So the STS performs those validation and returns a federated token that can be used by the app. So this flow diagram is essentially the same as the previous, similar to the previous one, but it has two additional components. Uh, so we have the kubelet on one side and then the external protected resource, which covers the end-to-end -end flow of what we are talking about today. Uh, and also as an example in this one, we are referring to the Microsoft Identity Platform. Uh, and in terms of the entire flow, kubelet generates the token, gives it to the workload as part of the pod startup. The pod can exchange that token, so it basically sends that to the identity platform. Uh, and then the identity platform at that point is going to check the trust on the identity, validate the incoming token uh, using the discovery protocol that we talked about, and then it issues an Azure AD access token to the workload. And at this point, the workload that's running on the cluster can send the aid Azure AD access token and it can get uh, it can access the resource. Uh, and an example of that is a pod trying to get a secret from Azure Key Vault. Um, and that brings me to the next slide, uh, which is a demo. So as part of this demo, what we're going to do is we're going to try setting up a kind cluster the hard way, uh, which involves uh, hosting the issuer URL uh, and the discovery document on the JSON web key set. And after that, I'm going to deploy a demo application that tries to use workload identity in Azure uh, to get a secret from Key Vault. Okay. Is, the, is the font visible or should we show me a bit? I have to see there. Okay, the first thing we're doing is we're generating a service account signing key pair that will be used by the kind cluster. And this, this step of setting up an Azure storage account for hosting issuer URL, this is something that we are doing for the demo because the OIDC issuer URL and the discovery doc needs to be publicly accessible on HTTPS. But if you have any cloud provider and you create a cluster with it, like all of this is handled by them. And then they also ensure that the service account signing keys are rotated on a regular basis. Okay, so this, sorry. So this is an example of the OpenID discovery doc. Uh, and as you can see here, it calls out the issuer that would also be present in the token. And then the JOX URI is basically the JSON web key set where the public signing keys are. So. Okay, so this one is uploading the discovery doc to the storage account so that it's publicly accessible. And once that's done, the next thing we could want to do is verify that we can get it using curl. Okay, um, so it's accessible. The next thing we do is we're gonna upload the public key uh, in the jocks doc. 
Uh, and then for the purpose of this demo, I am using a CLI tool that we built in Azure, which is called Azure Workload Identity CLI tool. And what it does, you can basically pass in an uh, input file which contains the public key, and then it will generate the jocks document for you. So it outputs that to jocks.json, which uh, if you know, there is a key ID, and then that's the public key the, for the service accounts. And that is also being uploaded. And then the next thing we do is very, we verify that that endpoint is also publicly accessible because uh, the AAD needs to get access to it. Um, and then the next thing we're doing is creating a kind cluster. Uh, it's a fairly simple config. Uh, but the things to note is we are reusing the keys that we generated at the start, the service account signing keys. And then in addition to that, we are configuring the service account issuer to be the URL that we just uh, uh, hosted. And that is, creates the cluster. I'm just going to skip those. OK. Uh, so the next thing we do is create an identity uh, on the cloud provider side. So in case of Azure, I'm creating a managed identity to which I'm going to tie the authorization rule. So the identity is created, and then the next thing that's doing is setting a policy in Key Vault to say the identity that we just created has get permissions for secrets. And this is the trust that I talked about while talking about federation. So basically, this command is setting up a trust on the cloud provider identity to say, if I give you a JOT that has this particular issuer that is there, and then is, has this particular subject, uh, then you can trust that and then give me a token. And then as part of the demo, I'm also installing the Azure Workload Identity webhook here just so that it makes my demo easier. Uh, but this is not something that is required. Uh, the purpose of the webhook is just to inject the environment variables that I need for the demo. But in addition to that, it will also add the projected service account token that can be used for workload identity. OK. Uh, and then in terms of the application, so basically we're creating a namespace called KubeCon Demo. And then we create a service account that can be used by the demo app. And then the annotation that I'm doing here is also with specific to Azure. It doesn't apply to every cloud provider. Uh, and once we do that, the next thing I'm doing is deploying a simple pod. And this pod is implemented using Azure SDKs to get a secret from Azure Key Vault. And all it does is loads up the projected service account token, exchanges that using the workload entity federation flow. OK, so once we do an apply and then wait for the pod to be running, uh, we're going to look at three things. The first thing is I want to show you the projected service account token that was injected into the pod. So like, let's look at the volume spec. And towards the end, we see that the Azure identity token is there. And then the lifetime of that is basically one hour. And the audience field is something that's static, that's configured for Azure Workload Identity. Uh, and then the next thing that we're going to do is look at the actual projected service account token that was injected into the pod. And I'm using the step CLI here to inspect it. Uh, but the key things to note is in there we have the audience field that we had configured. And then the issuer is also the service account issuer that was configured for the cluster. And obviously the additional claims. And then the subject is a concatenation of the namespace and the name. And then the last thing that we're going to do is see if in the logs that the pod is able to access it. So the pod got the secret from Key Vault uh, using workload identity. OK. Thanks, Anis. Um, though I just wanted to ask one question, Anis. Like, uh, you already mentioned this webhook, webhook thing. Yeah. You mentioned that it's not required. So if I deploy this workload or pod, and have this configuration to do the projected service account token mm -hmm. and establish the federated credential, we will be good. Yeah, so the webhook was only for injecting certain environment variables that was required for the Azure SDK. But uh, as long as you put the projected service account token volume in the pod, like you don't really need the webhook. Awesome. 
Um, so let's touch upon the other uses in Kubernetes. Um, so Cluster API provided Azure as a project which I contribute to, and it has started to use workload identity. Uh, we'll see in more detail how that works there. Also, Kubernetes secret store CSI driver uses workload identity. And folks who don't know what Cluster API provider Azure is, it's written on the screen. It's a, it's a SIG cluster lifecycle project that helps you provision Kubernetes cluster on Azure. There are other providers for Google, AWS, and et cetera. And one of the basic ways to give uh, credentials to you know, the Azure uh, cluster API provider, Azure manager, is using service principles uh, you know, so that that manager is able to create resources on Azure. And that is roughly using username passwords, which is not so decent. Um, so when we implemented workload identity in CAPZ, uh, we saw the demo that Anis gave. So this is on the top, you can see the spec of uh, the CAPZ manager, which tries to have a service account token. And this is what gets projected in, into the pod. And you can see on the top, in the bottom, this is the path where the token gets. And then it uses the SDKs to talk to, you know, Azure AD to access protected resources. And you, you were seeing in the demo where Anis used in CLI to, to create uh, identity here. I'm just trying to give an example. You can go onto the Azure portal and create an app registration uh, that is the equivalent of what was done in CLI. And once you, you create that application on Azure, you can now establish the federation. This is, we can call it like creating the federated credentials. And you can see that we put the cluster issuer URL and the namespace of the workload or the pod that is going to access the resources here on Azure, the service account name, and audience, right? Um, so once we're done with all of this, uh, this is more uh, CAPG specific, but the only thing that you now need to do is tell the client ID and the tenant ID to that pod, and you should be able to create clusters on Azure or talk to Azure to access resources. Okay. Uh, so the other usage that we want to talk about was secret store CSI driver. Uh, so it's a SIGOD subproject, um, and it basically implements the container storage interface. Uh, and it, what it does is it can talk to any external secret store, so, and it can get the secrets, and then it, it, it mounts them in tempfs. And uh, in the demo, we looked at an app which was custom, basically implementing Azure SDK to talk to Keyword. Uh, but if you were using a secret store CSI driver, uh, you didn't have to do any of that. Like you basically would have a generic code that reads from the file system, and then you would just install the driver and the provider uh, that would use workload entity to talk to your external secret store, get the secrets, and mount it for you. Uh, so this is a very high-level flow of the secret store CSI driver. Um, I know it's a lot even for the high level, uh, but what it what happens underneath is. Uh, the kubelet will generate the service account token on the node, and it does this when a pod gets created and says, hey, I want a volume using secret store CSI driver. And uh, the kubelet calls the CSI driver on Unix domain socket, so these tokens are sent as part of the RPC call. And at this point, the CSI driver sends those service account tokens to a CSI provider, which, again, is a Unix domain socket, and we support four different providers today, like uh, Azure, Google, AWS, HashiCorp, uh, with many more out there that have been implemented. Uh, but the CSI drive provider would use the service account tokens and then workload identity to talk to the external secret store, uh, get the secrets, sends it back to the provider, and then the provider sends it back to the driver and mounts the secret as tempfs. Um, and also, this token request in CSI driver was added in Kubernetes 120. Uh, it was majorly, it's, it's majorly used in Secret Store, but it could also be used by other CSI drivers 
uh, for disk attach detach, basically instead of using a common identity for the driver, you could actually rely on the workload's identity for performing operations. Okay, uh, so we wanted to put a meme, so that's why we have the slide. Uh, but we have come towards the end of the talk, uh, and we talked about the what and how of workload identity so far. So we would like to end our talk with some of the whys. Uh, and so the one thing is applications running uh, use a secret or a certificate to access protected resources in cloud provider. Uh, the issue with this is secrets and certificates pose a security risk. And the other thing is they could also expire. And once they expire, this could result in downtime. Uh, and then the other thing is managing secrets is just hard. Uh, so Workload Identity Federation essentially solves this problem uh, because you no longer have secrets. And in addition to that, Workload Identity also lets you assign distinct fine-grained uh, identities and authorization for each workload in your cluster. Um, these are some of the resources that you can look for if you want to understand more around service account token or workload identity. We, we, we talked about in context of Azure because that's where we contributed to and we were experimenting with, but workload identity in GKE is also something that's possible. It's a, it's a good read there. And we are done with the talk. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Um, one more thing. Yeah, you can send feedback. Uh, is there an equivalent to uh, this in AWS? Can I map a role into a, a workload? Or? Uh, yeah, so workload identity is supported pretty much by most of the cloud providers, uh, but basically you can map a service account token to one of that. So I've played with this a little bit. Um, one of the core problems that I have in Azure is that I need to, or I, I think I need to create a service account per pod, right? Uh, so uh, it depends. So like namespace is the security boundary. Sure. So, and you would have one service account per workload essentially. Yeah. 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 So uh -huh. it effectively to separate workloads, right? I have to go through that process of creating an individual service account. Now, of course, I have, you know, a thousand service accounts mm -hmm. that I then have to manage. Uh, sure, I don't have any more secrets, but I still have to manage that, those thousand service accounts, right? Uh, you, I think typically you already have service accounts tied to your workloads just to have like the RBAC tied down rather than having a default service account. Mm -hmm. But within the namespace, you would need to manage a service account per workload, like yes. Uh, but also on the other end, you would create a federated identity credential, so you would establish trust. I think your question's around having many FICs, like is that the concern? So, more do you have a recommendation for a more scalable solution to, you know, managing identities rather than, uh, you know, tying them directly to service accounts uh, in Azure specifically? So I think on the Azure side, Typically, you would already have a user assigned managed identity or an Azure AD service principle. And in terms of actual configuration, it comes down to just configuring FICs on that, right? Like, you would, because you already have service accounts in the cluster. So it comes down to managing FICs rather than like individual service accounts. Uh, and then I also know we're working on like a wildcard support. So you would be able to do something per namespace rather than doing like individual ones. Yeah. I'm waiting for the wild cards. Okay, but yeah, I mean, I would love to chat with you. After. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Hey guys, thanks for your talk. Uh, question for you, if you're running multi-container pods, uh, so say some business app container and then sidecar containers to do something, and you're using Workload Identity Federation, are, are you aware of any controls so that, um, say if a sidecar was compromised, that workload identity, the federation, that the, the compromised sidecar container wouldn't be able to leverage the federation that's uh, been made available for the business app? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it applies on the pod level. Uh, so the thing is, if, if you look at the claims that's added, the subject is just the service account name and namespace, which is tied to just every container in there. So in case of a compromise, you can't go to as granular as a single container. Like, it would just essentially mean the entire pod is compromised. So that's a no. <laughs> yes. Do you know, is anyone working on anything like that? Uh, no. Get more granular within the pod? No, but uh, again, I would love to chat. Okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, and if you have more questions, we can chat up here.